Hi everyone, Trina here, and this is going to be 4.0. Interesting too, we went at the number 4 when we're getting into the, the hidden stuff. The stuff that must be suppressed. So 4 to me is wholeness. And we're getting ready to come into some pretty powerful stuff, I have a feeling. So again, we were going into chapter 16, page 311. <laughs> the teachings that must be suppressed. So here we go. And it says, Wisdom, justice, beauty, harmony, and compassion are the qualities that have traditionally been identified with the divine feminine. Yet, it is also the irresistible power that destroys old forms and brings new ones into being. The inspiration of the love and action that is so needed to transform a culture radically out of touch with its soul. Anne Baring and Andrew Harving, Harvey, the Divine Feminine. You know, she quotes this book over and over again. So I have a feeling this is going to be the next next book I purchase. Anne Baring and Andrew Harvey, Harvey, the Divine Feminine. I have a feeling that this is a very beautiful book. So if y'all are looking for some more Divine Feminine material, I have a feeling that this one's going to be profound. So... While the destruction of the Jews, of um, while the destruction of Jesus's many lost teachings has caused a kind of sickness in our world today, there is nowhere that this imbalance is more profoundly felt than in the deletion of the Divine Mother. Wow. For nearly two thousand years, the Western world has been taught almost exclusively about God the Father and this masculinity biased theology ha that has shaped our use of language, law, culture, property rights, teaching, and the values of aggression, dominance, superiority to cultures around the world. It has also resulted in the abuse of women and children as men have chosen the path of power over the path of love. And again, this extreme imbalance has left our societies ruthless, patriarchal, and censored. And yes, yeah, censored the development of our spiritual, intuitive, and psychic nature. Wow. Which, when cultivated, eventually leads to your own inner gnosis. However, when we study the New Testament Gospels, it is clear that Jesus was not only an advocate of all people everywhere, regardless of age, caste, wealth, or education, but that he did not share the gender prejudices that the men of his day did. Scholars have pointed out in his teachings the equality between men and women that were perceived and they were perceived as dangerous by both the Jews and the Romans since they called into questioning the existing the existing patriarchal structure of that day by honoring women as people in their own right and as equals Jesus threatened the very power structures that were already in place in both the Jewish and the Roman societies. They deleted the, fem the feminine voice. For over 500 years before the birth of Jesus, the cult of Yahweh had excelled in suppressing all traces of either female culture or female deity. At the time when Jesus lived, women had no legal protection except to that given to them by their fathers, husbands, or sons. They were value, valued only for their ability to keep the house, make the meals, and produce the offspring, which in essence is all life, wow, and serve man's sexual needs. 
In many Jewish households, women were not even allowed to serve food or eat with the guests if another male was present, a custom still prevalent in the Muslim world today. In Hebrew culture, girls were given in marriage to an appropriate man of their father's choosing. A new wife's job was to obey her husband and have sex with him, run his household, and bear his children. If she should not fulfill these roles to, these roles to her husband's satisfaction, she could be turned out as a beggar, a slave, a prostitute, or the unwanted extra mouth to feed in a man's home, since she had no way of making her own living. Hebrew law instructed that every man who opened the womb of a woman was blessed. Luke 2.23 Reiterating the womb's primary mandate to bear her husband's offspring. A woman could also be sold as property, passed from father to master like a possession. I remember a lifetime where I experienced that and it was, it was horrible. I was royalty and I was sold as a princess to an old king who was an evil man. It was terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> At the time of Jesus, Jewish men could be married to multiple women, as we can observe in the case of King Herod. But divorce could only be initiated by the man. Women had no rights to choose their husbands or petition for divorce. The school of Hillel <coughs> sorry, decreed that a man could divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever, simply by giving her a writ of paper. And this became the, exact, the accepted position in the subsequent Judaism. While a man could have multiple wives, Jewish law declared that any woman who lost her virginity before marriage <coughs> sorry, was to be burned or stoned to death. If a girl was raped, she was forced to marry her rapist. And if she was already betrothed or married, then she had to be killed. Archaeologist and priest Roland D. Vox writes about the rights of women in ancient Israel. All the texts show that the Israelites wanted mainly sons to perpetuate the family line and fortune and to preserve the ancestral inheritance a husband could divorce his wife. Women, on the other hand, could not ask for divorce. If the wife called her husband Baal, wow, B-A apostrophe A-L, wow, which was God, or master, she also called him Adon, or Lord. She addressed him in the fact as a slave addresses their master, their subject, or king. The declug includes a man, a man's wife among his possession, a decalogue. The decalogue, I guess is how you say that, includes a man's wife among his possessions. The wife does not inherit from her husband, nor daughters from their father, except when there is a male heir. A vow made by a girl or a married woman, by a married woman, needs to be valid the consent of the father or husband, and if this consent is withheld, the vow is null and void. The man has the right to sell his daughter. In Rome and Greece, although women did not have the same rights as men in the first century CE, they were able to study the arts and pursue medical studies, attend concerts or theaters, and take part in business court and social life. They could also, also engage in athletics, own property, become educated, and travel without male escorts. In all sects of Jewish faith, however, except the Essenes, women were not even encouraged to read or write. They were certainly not allowed to own property. Their role was to sit far away from the men 
as far away from men as possible in the gallery section of the temple, while the men preached, argued, and prayed in the main synagogue below. While the Gnostic Christians honored both genders equally, the double standard of the Jews was soon adopted by the Orthodox Catholic Church, supplanting the gender equality that Jesus had sought to re-establish the role of Mary Magdalene as, Je as Yeshua's chief apostle was entirely deleted from Christianity and all of history. All the books that contained these references to a female divine were omitted. Those in which women played a prominent ecclesiastical role were not included. Those that urged the authority of personal experience over the authority of priests and bishops were all left out. Essentially, the books that supported the orthodox view and the power of the institution were kept, while those that did not were rejected. But they were not only rejected, they were collected and destroyed, their ideas vilified, their proponents driven away or persecuted. Historian Elaine Pagels writes that the efforts to destroy every trace of heretical blasphemy by the Orthodox majority was so successful that until the discoveries of the Nag Hammadi, all information on all alternative forms of Christianity came only from Orthodox records or attacks against them. Jesus' teachings about equality not only incensed the Pharisees, but annoyed his own apostle up his own apostles. In the Gospel of Thomas, there is a scene where Simon Peter turns to the other disciples and says, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life, indicating his complete abhorrence of the female gender. This expressed the prevailing mindset of the Hebrew culture, where women existed only to serve men. Biblical translators report that Jesus answered by saying, Behold! I myself shall guide her, being in order to make her male, that she, like you, shall become a living spirit, like you males. For every person who transcends being woman or man shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Thomas 114, 5 through 10. Yet the word male in this passage was, was originally the Greek word anthropos, which means androgynous one. The word whose true meaning is fully perfected human being beyond either gender. Yes. And also means the original anthropomorph, um, having both. Later, Jesus qualifies this transcendence of sexual orientation when he says, when you make the two into one, so that you will make the male and the female into a single one, in order that the male is not made male, nor the female made female. When you make the eyes into an eye, then you shall enter the kingdom make the two one bring the feminine and the masculine together and they become one and this is the true anointing this seemingly obtuse statement about uniting the polarities within ourselves so that we can awaken our inner sight yes and we have seen this concept it lies in the very heart of the sacred marriage that was taught by jesus by embracing both the yin and the yang aspects of your very own nature, we gain the power to achieve enlightenment. But since the Gospel of Thomas was removed from the Orthodox canon, today most people have no concept that Jesus taught inner alchemy and that which restores the balance between the two sides of ourselves, the masculine and the feminine. As we have seen, the Gnostics, or the earliest followers of Jesus, they honored both aspects of the Creator and taught the sacred alchemy of enlightenment. This was also a core teaching of the great mystery schools. 
And it is this spiritual union that takes place within the sacred schools. And it, it is the spiritual union that takes place within the sacred heart that is needed to heal our world. So let us take a look now at some of Jesus' teachings about the existence of the Divine Mother and Father and the importance of honoring both aspects of the Divine. The Father, Mother of Creation Today, the only version of God that most people are familiar with is God the Father, and yet Jesus referred to the Creator as the Abba, Amma, or the Father, Mother, God. Among the many texts that speak about the Divine Father and Mother are the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Secret Book of John, the Gospel to the Hebrews, the Sophia of Jesus Christ. That is a beautiful book. But many of the Gospels were buried as a result of the, of the papal edicts issued by Emperor Constantine between the years 326 and 333. In the Gospel of Philip, Jesus tells us, Truth is the mother. Knowledge is the father. Clearly revealing that there are two aspects of the Creator. We can seek to comprehend this in a Gnostic writing called The Great Announcement. The origin of the universe is explained. From the power of silence appeared. The great power of the mind of the universe which manages all things. A male and the other a great intelligence a female which produces all things. The author explains that these two powers joined in union are discovered to be duality. This is mind in intelligence and these are separate from one another yet they are one found in a state of duality. This Gnostic teacher explains, there is in everyone a divine power existing in a latent sleeping condition. This one power divided above and below, generating itself, making itself grow, seeking itself, finding itself, being mother of itself, father of itself, sister of itself, spouse of itself, daughter of itself, son of itself, mother-father unity, being a source of the entire circle of existence. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus speaks about the many inter immediate gods or goddesses who live in the other dimensions. Yes. But the supreme creator is above them all. In the three heavens, there are merely gods. Where there is the father and the mother, I myself am with him. Thomas 31 through 5. Jesus goes on to contrast our earthly parents with our divine ones, reminding the initiate of its true allegiance. He who does not turn away from his earthly father and mother in my way will not be able to become my disciple. And he who does not love his heavenly father and his mother in my way will not be able to become my disciple. For my mother has begotten me but my true mother gave me life. Thomas 101, 1 through 8. Valentinus and Marcus, both leaders of the early Gnostic Church, called the Divine Mother the Grace. She is who is before all things. She, incorruptible wisdom. She, 
who can only be found through the mystical and eternal silence. She is equated with the divine Sophia, the mother of wisdom. Valentinus also taught, although the deity is essential, indescribable, it can be imagined as a dyad, a dyad. Out of this twosome, creation is born. This includes the divine son, and daughter, who are the direct emanations of their celestial parents. In Christianity, we are only taught about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no mention of the Divine Feminine, yet the Holy Spirit is the mother or daughter or spirit that permeates all things and brings all things into form and being. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus warns us, He who blasphemes against the Father, it shall be forgiven unto him. And he who blasphemes against the Son, it shall be forgiven to him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either on earth or in heaven. Thomas 44 one through seven. Again, master number all the way again, 44, one through seven. Pay attention. That's a powerful thing because of its numerology associated to it. As the bells chime. <laughs> so interesting. Yes, we cannot blaspheme our mother. Apparently that one will not be tolerated. And look what's happening in this world. They're blaspheming the mother. Mmm. Ouch. <coughs> the teachings of the Gnostics make this so abundantly clear. One Gnostic prayer begins, From the Father, and through thee, the Mother, the two immortal names, parents of the divine being, and thou, Dweller in heaven, humanity of the one mighty name. In the gospel of the Holy Twelve, Jesus teaches, In God there is neither male nor female, and yet both are one. Yes. And God is the two in one. Yes. Therefore, shall the name of the father and mother be equally hallowed, for they are are the great power of God. And the one is not without the other in the one God. 63, 2. The Gnostic Gospel of Mary Magdalene also speaks about this theme. Mary Magdalene taught, Christ has one mother and she is the queen of heaven. The body is born of the earthly mother, but the soul of light is born in the heavenly mother. And that mother spirit that awakens the soul of light. Mary gave birth to a child in the world, but the mother spirit gave birth to the Christ. Yes. So it is with all who are anointed with the supernal light. In the Gospel to the Hebrews, Jesus speaks about my mother and the Spirit. Yet, how many of us have been taught to pray this way? None, I venture. Most of us were never told about the existence of a Divine Mother, let alone a Divine Daughter. But since all the forces in the cosmos have a complementary aspect, this certainly makes sense. Where there is a father, there is also a mother. If there is a son, there is most certainly a daughter. Does it not seem odd that we have been so conditioned by our patriarchal filters that we do not even question this? Especially when the biology dictates that it, it takes both sexes to create life. 
Virgin of the World. We will pick up on the next one with that. I love these lost teachings, these hidden teachings. They helped me confirm so much about what I knew inside my heart. And um, it, it helped me to understand why I came in with such a strong spirit and such a protective nature in the protection of animals, the protection of people, and the protection of, of all things that um, need your protection. So it, it seems like it's very strong within my code because I've been exhibiting those behaviors since I was a small child. First time I got kicked out of school was because I beat up a school bully. School bull bully problem was over because when the school bully got beat up by a girl, it was game over. But yes, this literally, that's how strong this has been brought into my spirit codes and to my path. There seems to be um, something within me that just cannot tolerate abuse or injustice or unfairness. And I don't know why, but inside my soul, I know that it is always perfect to stand up for balance. And it's always perfect to stand up for um, fairness and equality and compassion towards other beings, especially the ones that can't protect themselves. Those are the ones that we were brought here as the caretakers of. So we need to remember that, that we are the guardians and we're supposed to be the hands that protect those who are being abused by the abusers. If we physically can protect them, it's our job to do so. And when we can embrace that and start truly loving one another and respecting one another and loving our planet and loving all the creatures, I think we can really see heaven on earth because I've seen it. So... I think you guys are the chance to manifest it. So we're going to keep going, keep learning, keep connecting, and keep growing. And hopefully start growing plants, trees, seeds, flowers, and all the beautiful things that nature has given to us. Because right now I can see the artificial construct is trying to destroy so much of what our mother has given us. And I, for one, I'll do everything I can to protect it and preserve it. And a lot of that, too, is going with this stuff, the teachings and the hidden stuff, and all the stuff that Mother Earth is belching out of the hidden caves of her belly in her womb to give back to her children so that we might find her and reconnect with her once again. So I love you all. Have a beautiful day or night, wherever you may be. And I'll see you on the next one.